enjoy it later. Uh, not right now, because you're here with um, just a, a wonderful writer. I'm so excited about this. Before I start, um, I'm going to read over my checklist here. Um, welcome, everyone, to the 10th Annual uh, San Antonio Book Festival. So happy to see all of you. I hope you're all hydrating and fanning and all of the things. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm going to thank the Central Library for helping us present this amazing day and the Russell Hill Rogers Fund for the Arts for sponsoring the venue. Um, and I just want to make sure that you are taking photos and tweeting and all of the things you like to do on social media by using the hashtag SA Book Fest. Um, the masks are available if you want one. Um, we have a venue volunteer. You see them all over in purple shirts. Uh, ask one of them or raise your hand during the session. They'll bring you a mask. Um, and then this is really important. Uh, we really want to support writers like Emma and all of the amazing novelists and, and writers who are here. Uh, so you want to buy the books. Um, I'm definitely going book shopping um, after this. And uh, you want to do that at another bookshop tent outside. Uh, actually, that's where the book sales and the book signings are going to be. So her book signing will start 15 minutes after the session ends, which is at 3.30 is when it ends. So 3.45, thus, is when her book signing starts. And um, also, we're going to do a Q&A. So I will make sure to uh, wrap it up in time to let you ask the questions that you have for her. And please, of course, silence your cell phones and flash photography. It's not permitted. <laughs> so please, don't be tempted. <laughs> and um, and I guess that's it. So I will I will remind you once again about the book signing when we're done. So let's get started. Um, again, I'm Kathy Blackwell. I'm an editor at Texas Monthly. And um, Emma Straw is the New York Times bestselling author of four wonderful novels. Uh, until this one, so that means five. Um, and most recently, All Adults Here, which came out in 2020. What's right? Um, the Vacationers, Modern Lovers, and Laura Lamont's Life in Pictures. And she also has a book of short stories called Other People We Marry. She and her husband own a bookstore, Books Are Magic, in Brooklyn. Her brand new book, This Time Tomorrow, which I was going to hold up, so there you go. And <laughs> it just came out this week. Um, and speaking of time, my sense of time is so messed up right now that when I saw that it was coming out May 17th, I thought, wow, her book is coming out weeks after the book festival. <laughs> oh, wait, that was days ago. <laughs> I'm so confused. Um, so one thing I'm going to try not to give away, I, I won't give away any spoilers about this book, but it is a very different book for Emma, which we'll talk about, because it's about time travel. Um, and so I wanted to go ahead and just get started, Emma. Um, you are known for writing about very modern, very real characters from all wonderful points of view, um, very realistic, you know, to a twin extent, scenes. Uh, and you decided to take a, a very real character and have her time travel. So can you tell me how you came up with the concept of time travel? Yeah, I mean, so what, what's funny to me about writing a time travel novel is that I really, other than the fact that I had to solve time travel, by which I mean like figure out how the time travel in my novel was gonna work and what the rules were, it was exactly the same as writing all of my other novels. You know, I, I still had to, you know, figure out who the characters were and what they were going to do and all of that. And and to me, I wrote the most um, the most like realist version of time travel I could possibly imagine. So I, even though, like, I remember, because I was writing, early in the pandemic, I was writing a, a, another novel that on the surface had more in common with my previous books, and I had to call my editor <laughs> and say, like, you know that book that you bought for me that I am writing for you? I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to write time travel. Um, and to her credit, she said, okay. Um, and I think it's because when I described it to her, um, it was clear that it was not about time travel. You know, I think there are, there are books that are about time travel, um, and mine is not. Mine is about a father and a daughter. That's, that's what it's about. Okay, good. And so, father, daughter, before um, we came out, you were saying, you were talking to another writer um, about memoir, and you were saying that you would never write a memoir. You actually wrote a memoir, in a way, um, this book. It's, it's not you. It's completely fiction. 
but yeah, it's probably the most personal book you'll write, and that's because it's set where you grew up. Uh, you mentioned your father. He so in the beginning, I'm not going to get anything away. In the beginning of the book. Um, a woman named Allison is about to turn 40, and her father is ill. It's just a very normal, natural thing that we all go through. And um, she is uh, it's, she's approaching her birthday, and magic happens in terms of going back to her 16th birthday when she wakes up. So your father. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I when I when I started when I started writing this book, my so. I should back up and say that my, like Alice in the book, um, Alice's father is a science fiction novelist. Um, and my father is not a science fiction novelist, but he, he does write genre fiction. Peter Straub is his name. He's wonderful. And he writes very scary books. Um, some are sort of psychological horror. Some are like supernatural horror. Um, he gets around, but they're all really scary. <laughs> Um, and when I when I was writing this book, he was in the hospital. He was in the hospital for several months um, of 2020, not with COVID, but with heart heart problems. Um, and yeah, I you know it's I, I don't want to describe this book as as like my therapy because it, you know I don't want to diminish diminish it as as a novel, um, but I definitely used everything that I was going through and everything that I was feeling um, to pour into this book about these characters. And, and it was a, a really um, pleasurable way for me to think about what I was going through. It's very intimate. And I think that's why when you say that the book is you know, it's a time travel plot, uh, but it's not about time travel. It really is about the choices and relationships and all of the things. Um, so, um, so the book, when she goes back in time, she goes back to her 16th birthday. And so, of course, I was talking to a friend of mine who's more closer to my age. And she's like, oh, the 80s. <laughs> we both went into kind of like, yeah. No, it was 1990s. <laughs> that was my joke for more of my, my generation. <laughs> and last night I was doing an Instagram post about this and I thought, oh, Time After Time by Cindy Lauper is the perfect song. But of course that was a decade past. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, but, but you know, I, I mean, I was a child of the 80s and so all I did, like every day of my life was watch MTV for like six hours. Um, <laughs> And so time after time is absolutely applicable always. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so speaking of which, so how, so when you put her in 1996, um, you, you, of course, you referenced a lot of pop culture from that time. So did you have a playlist going on? How did you, because you, you mentioned some things that I completely forgotten about and all the little touches, like the Reality Bites poster, um, you know, mentioning a few of the movies and, and TV shows they would have seen. Yeah. I mean, that that was, you know, it, it's it's sort of hard for me to describe the, like, the tone of this book because it is at once, um, like, you know, sad and simultaneously, I think, like, hilariously funny. <laughs> If I do say so myself, um, but like it, it's it's full of all of the fun of remembering things that that I loved and was surrounded by as a teenager. Um, in terms of like research, I would say what I did is I closed my eyes and I thought about my teenage bedroom and I recreated it as much as as much as possible. And then I was just texting my friends from childhood all the time saying like, what, what will I kick myself for not including? And I mean, and that was, you know, both like pop cultural stuff and, and just stuff from our lives. Like, you know, one of the things that, so, you know, so Alice goes back to 1996 and, and one of the, <laughs> One of the most like transporting parts of it for me, writing it, was thinking about walking down the street then and thinking like, okay, so that 
diner used to be this restaurant, and that clothing store used to be this video store, and before that it was this, and um, you know, that, that sort of thing that I think we all do, no matter where we're from, um, you know, if you've lived in a place a really long time, you watch it change, and you watch it evolve or devolve, or just, just turn into a different version of itself. Um, and in New York City, where the book is set, that is, that is certainly true. Um, and it was, it was so pleasurable, especially during those early months of the pandemic, um, for me to sort of astral project myself out of my house where I was stuck with my two very noisy, very beautiful, very noisy children, um, and go to this place that I knew so well. And I, you know, it, it's like, for me, it, it's, you know, it's feel, it's like full of New York City, but I think that, you know, my hope is that when people read it, that it doesn't matter that I'm talking about my, my diner, you know, that was on the corner of 86 and Columbus, that doesn't matter. It's like, I want, I want people to think about their, their places where they would sit until two o'clock in the morning, just eating French fries and like drinking a cup of coffee. It definitely did that for me. And um, I remember, I think it was in Modern Lovers, um, one of her previous books that's also set in New York. Um, I think you had a, a little section that talked about how you, knew a true, like you were a true New Yorker when you could remember what a place had been at least three different iterations. Like if you remember it being a bakery and a nightclub and a dry cleaner, then you were a true, like of the neighborhood, is that right? And so the memory of place, I think is really important in this, in this book. Um, so did you keep diaries when you were a teenager? Did you refer to those diaries, photos, that kind of thing? Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I don't know if I would recommend it exactly. Like, there were there were things that I definitely had forgotten. Um, I, I have always been a, a, a loyal, dedicated diarist, starting when I was 10. And I, I am a hoarder from a family of hoarders, so I have them all. Um, and especially, I was especially prolific in my teenage years, as so many of us are. Um, God, I mean, really the feeling, the feeling that I had was like, you know, cringe, 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 of course. Um, but also I just felt really grateful that I didn't have a cell phone, you know, that I, that I had no, I was a teenage smoker. So I had that like to play with and be nervous with, but, but I'm so grateful that I didn't have a cell phone because it meant that like I needed to channel all of my anxiety somewhere and they just it just went all into my diaries. I mean I kept like just dozens I have dozens of them. I have dozens of them. Um one thing when we were talking about the references, one thing that, you, that I love also about the book is that you do a lot of time travel references, which makes it even more realistic as you can get for a time travel novel. Um, so you talk, I mean, so she knows that, so Alice, she knows uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Venture, she knows Back to the Future, 13 going on 30, all of those things. And so that was fun to see them. It, it felt, that, that felt really fun to me. Yeah, and I mean, because my, my thought, is that you know if this happened to Alice, the character Alice and I are exactly the same age, and I just I thought if this happened to me, I wouldn't I wouldn't do the thing that happens in like you know ninety percent of other time travel novels and be like <gasps> I don't know I wouldn't like gasp and think like oh my god this has never happened before um, I have no idea what to do I would immediately start scrolling through the time travel narratives that are already a part of my consciousness to try to figure out what kind of thing I was in um, and and you know figure out if I if it like, am I stuck forever how do I get out you know do I have to do something is it like am I gonna erase my parents like you know all those things um, from all those movies and all those books um, and you know I've always I've always, wanted to keep like pop culture 
out of my books, um, just because it, I don't know, it, 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 it dates, you know, it dates whatever you're working on. But, but when I was writing this, I really, I just thought, well, it's dated, it's dated anyway because she's, she's going to 1996. And, and if you do the math, you know, and you know that she's 40 and that she's 16 and in, in 1996, you know, it's 2020. And, and so I think, I thought like this book is going to be, um, like surrounded by, uh, people's awareness of what year it is anyway. Um, so I thought, well, so then who cares? Who cares? Like, I'm going to have fun. I'm going to put, I'm going to pour all of this in. I'm going to put in all the Mariah Carey. I'm going to put in like all the, all the, all the, like the, the, the fashion and the movies and like everything. Um, because it, because it, it would be weird or not to. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, movies does it all the time. I mean, you know, friends, Peggy Sue that. Like you see that married, that's right, right? Um, you know, so you know, um, you know all of these these things, but also, like I was thinking about books like The Time Traveler's Wife, which also does the same thing. Um, you have to mention the violent films or, or whatever it is to, to be specific, I and mean, it does not feel dated at all. I know they're making a show about it, so it must, it must have had a lasting impact. Um, but um, so, so Alice does not know how she got back in time. Um, and you talked earlier about how you were, you had to come up with the rules, like how, did you know as you were writing what the rules were and how she got back or did that kind of develop as you were writing? No, I had to, I had to figure that out up top. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm a planner. I'm a planner. And so I need to know as much as possible going into a book or even to just like convince myself, fool myself that I know, um, before I start. So. And, and that I knew that was crucially important um, because I wanted it to be I wanted it to be so simple, so simple because I because it, I, I didn't want readers to be distracted by it and to be like I don't know doing some sort of mathematical uh, equations like I, you know there there are other there are other writers different kinds of writers science fiction writers. Who who really want to delve into that? But that's not me. You know, I'm I'm not a science fiction writer, um, and so I, I just needed it to be efficient and clear. That the, those are those are my goals. And once I felt like I figured that out, then I then I knew I could do it. Um, so if you had one day to go back to, what would it be? That's hard. That's hard. I don't Sorry. know. I mean, right now I would say like a, like a, like a cool day. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, not, I don't think this is too much of a spoiler, but like one thing that I decided was true is that, is that the, is the, you know, the, the future is, quite sticky, that our lives are quite sticky, kind of like my forehead right now. Um, but that, that, that we can't change our lives sort of as much as we think, that like we're, we're, we're pretty much sturdy, that people are pretty sturdy. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, Alice has, has sort of notions of things that she wants to change in the present. Um, but I don't think I would worry about that. I think I would just really like, enjoy hanging out with my family the earlier version of my family like say, appreciating how young my parents were my grandparents you know my brother as a kid like i i think i would i would that i would just want to hang out and watch jeopardy and i think that's what uh for me and i'm sure for for a lot of readers that's kind of what resonates when you were talking about it'll make you think about your own childhood bedroom, your own neighborhood. It certainly did that for me. And it also made me think about just the, the passing of time and how things, when you're, when you're a person in it, you, you're not realizing what's happening and the transformation. And so you have a lot of great little details in there about that, just about the things she notices that she'd forgotten about that I thought was just, would really resonate and, and make you think about your own, your own time. 
Now, you recently did an interview with New York Magazine, and before you met with the writer, do you want to tell the reader, or the yeah. audience, the readers, what happened? Yeah, it was it was just the craziest craziest day in my life. So, so New York Magazine was going to write this profile about me and send a send a photographer, and it, the the book takes place on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, which is the neighborhood that I grew up in, and they asked where I should have the photographer meet us and we were going to sort of walk around and take pictures in a few different spots. And I said, well, meet on my on the stoop of the house that I grew up in. My parents moved out of that house about seven years ago. And and they're like, sure, okay, whatever. And so I get there and I, you know, I'm sitting on my stoop and with this very young kind, thankfully, photographer um and we were just sort of getting started and i was already like oh it's my house you know because my parents lived in that house for 30 years so it's it's where i you know started kindergarten and it's where i got married you know i got whatever so we're sitting there and this guy an escalade pulls up in this dapper guy dressed all in white hops out and he said, are you here to see the house? And I said, "Are you, no, are you showing the house? And he said, yeah. And I said, can I come in? He said, sure, and he, like, he didn't care. And so I asked the photographer if she minded. She said, ah, very there, you know? And so he opens the door and I walk in my house and I burst into tears immediately and proceeded to walk this like 22 year old photographer from New York Magazine, like all around my parents' house and be like, this is the room I got married in. Like, this is, this is the bathroom. This is my kitchen, you know, like, this is my room, this is my brother's room, this is my room, you know. Um, she was so nice. <laughs> she didn't take my picture in there. Um, I was just sobbing, and it was the weirdest experience. It was the weirdest experience, and I just felt like, just like I like I like I'd never left, you know. I, luckily, it, the house the house was 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 being staged, so like the, the person who bought it from my parents wasn't living in it anymore, and so it, it had very little furniture in it and zero personality. You know, there were no like, like I was like, this is the wall where we used to mark how tall we were. You know, like if there was someone else's family on that wall, I think I, I would have had a different reaction. But but it but it was it was an empty. It was it was like we had just walked out the door. Um, yeah, it was wild. It was wild. And then after the photographer and I walked around <laughs> crying for a little while then I met up with the, the journalist who was writing the piece, and I was like, I'm sorry, <laughs> because, like, you just missed it. You just missed the, the thing. <laughs> yeah, the magazine writers in that house are like, dang. Yeah, it was terrible. She felt terrible. I, it, the, the profile was very, very nice, but, yeah, it was, it was wild. It was like, like, it, I, I, I felt like, I really hope she doesn't think that I, like, staged this somehow, you know, like, like I manufactured this. I didn't, obviously, I mean, I guess I wouldn't have been like sobbing uncontrollably. But, yeah. yeah, the worst part was, not the worst part, but for the writer was that she was going to take you on a time travel tour of your favorite haunts and we had to skip that. Um, so I was so excited to talk to you that I forgot to ask you, I would like for you to read a sure. little bit. Do you want to tell sure. me where? Yes. So I'm going to read just a, a couple of pages. Um, from uh, the the scene in which Alice Alice has just woken up, um, so she went. To, you know, she passes out on the night of her fortieth birthday, and then she wakes up and she's she's inside her her childhood bedroom, but she doesn't she doesn't really she doesn't know what's what yet. Um, it was only then that she looked down at her own body. 
She was wearing boxer shorts and an enormous yellow Crazy Eddie t-shirt that pooled in her lap. Her thighs, even flattened against the toilet seat, sorry, she's peeing, we're not giving her any privacy, looked narrow as if she'd somehow lost weight in the night. Alice didn't remember changing clothes, and even if she had, she hadn't seen this shirt in decades, a relic from her childhood. She stood up and pulled the shirt taut to admire it, a real piece of New York City history. The television commercial began to play in her brain. There was no way that Alice was not gonna wear it home. Ursula, that's the cat, her dad's cat, wound her body around Alice's feet and then ran off, no doubt to wait by her food bowl. Alice heard a noise from the other room, probably the clean cat sitter. Alice quickly pushed the door closed, not wanting to frighten the child, right? Because in, in 2020, her father's in the hospital and the girl who lives next door is feeding the cat. Leonard's bathroom was like a time capsule. Maybe it was that he still went to the old fashioned pharmacy he'd always gone to, or maybe it was that contemporary branding hadn't arrived on the Upper West Side. But everything in the bathroom, Leonard's toothpaste, his shaving cream, the towels that had once been beige and now just looked dirty always, looked the way it always had. Alice squeezed an inch of Colgate onto her finger and brushed her teeth. I'll be right out, she called, it's Alice. Children probably didn't have heart attacks very often, but when she thought about her own childhood on Commander Walk, that's the street we lived on, there had been a lot of talk about stranger danger, stranger danger, excuse me, and she'd always been ready to kick and bite like every good city girl. There was a quiet response, and so Alice straightened her t-shirt and walked out into the hall. She was a grown-up who worked with kids and could talk to anyone, even when she, when she was wearing, even if she was wearing the kind of pajamas she'd worn as a teenager. Ursula was perched in her favorite spot, the part of the windowsill directly above the heater vent, a black fur baking in the sun. She was the world's most ancient cat. No one knew exactly how old she was, but if Alice had to guess, she would have said she was 25 or immortal. She still looked just as vital as she ever had. Hey, good morning, Alice said, turning the corner from the hallway into the kitchen. I hope I didn't scare you. You're not that scary, said her dad. Leonard Stern was sitting in his spot at the kitchen table. There was a cup of coffee next to him and an open can of Coca-Cola. Next to his drink, Leonard had a plate with some toast and a few hard boiled eggs. Alice thought she could see an Oreo too. The clock on the wall behind the table said that it was seven in the morning. Leonard looked good. He looked healthy, healthier actually than Alice could never ever remember him looking. He looked like he could run around the block if he wanted to, just for fun, like the kind of dad who could play catch and teach his kid how to ice skate, even though he absolutely wasn't. Leonard looked like a movie star, like a movie star version of himself, handsome, young, and quick. Even his hair looked bouncy, its waves full and the deep, rich brown they had been in her childhood. When had his hair started to gray? Alice didn't know. Leonard looked up and made eye contact with her. He turned to look at the clock, back to Alice, and shook his head. You are up early, though. A new leaf. I like it. What was happening? I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. And so as you saw there, it was really about just these little details. There's no big, you know, like, car crashing into the future or, what, or into the past. Um, I should say. Um, so um, I want to kind of go back a little bit. You opened your bookstore in 2017. Can you talk about your bookstore, Bookstore Magic, and why you and your husband decided to do this? Yeah. Um, so in, in 2016, my husband and I moved from where we were living in Brooklyn, another neighborhood, back to Cobble Hill, which is the neighborhood we lived in before. And uh, it was because I was very pregnant with our second child and I really wanted to be able to walk to my favorite bookstore. It was very important to me in that like eight month pregnant way, things can become very important that weren't necessarily crucially important before. Um, and so we moved back and we were living a few blocks away from, from a bookstore called Book Court where I had worked in my twenties and a place that I loved enormously. And then the owners decided to retire after running this independent bookstore for 35 years, which is an extremely long time. It's like, 
can't fault them for that. Um, they had certainly earned their retirement. Um, and then, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it sounds so silly, but genuinely my thought was, well, I don't want to move again. Uh, you know, I was pregnant and then I had a brand new baby. It was all very like postpartum brain hormones. It seemed easier to me for us to open a bookstore and learn how to operate a bookstore than to move. In retrospect, I know that this is not the case um, because moving is temporary, a temporary pain um, and running a business is not. Um, but yeah, we've been open for five years now and and we learn something new every day. I, it's incredible. I'm so proud of it. It's such a beautiful place. If you ever come up to Brooklyn, come see us on Smith Street. What's your magic? We've got a big pink mural. You can't miss us. And has that affected your writing at all? Writing the bookstore? It sure has. Um, you know, I have less time, uh, for sure. But it's also true that, and I, I was talking to my fellow writer slash bookstore owner, owner Ann Patchett about this recently, that we are, we are more efficient now. Like I, and I thought I was pretty efficient before, you know, having two children and figuring out how to work in between, you know, school drop off and school pick up. Um, you know, I was always already efficient. Um, but now, you know, now there's just another thing that I do. So, so I can't write every day and I can't be at the bookstore every day, but, um, you know, I, I have stopped trying to find balance <laughs> because I think it, it's just, it, it's impossible. Like I can't, I can't devote myself, um, equally to both things at this, like at the same time. I can't, I can't, I can't be like knee deep in writing a book and at the bookstore five days a week. Um, but that's okay. Uh, and, and, you know, my staff is incredible. My booksellers are incredible. And um, they are all so much better at doing everything at the bookstore than I am. Um, and, and that's why it works. Okay, well, we have a few minutes for some questions, audience questions. Does anyone have a question for Emma? You have somebody with a mic. Oh, you have a question. Oh, I thought you had a microphone. I'm sorry. I've got it. Here, oh, okay. here. yes. Yeah. Um, my daughter lives in Brooklyn, and when she told me she visits frequently your bookstore, and when she told me who owned it, I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" And so when I saw you were going to be here today, I'm like, "I'm going to have to go and catch you because I love your writing. I'm originally from New Jersey and in New York, so when I read your, your I haven't read this one, one obviously, but I feel I can, I can put myself wherever they when they're in New York or they're in New something." Thank you. Tell your daughter I say hello. I will. <laughs> Hopefully she'll meet you guys and you better. Yeah, tell her to just track me down. I'm very we've got walkie talkies at the store. They can just call me and I will tell yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. About writing about time travel. Is that in all of the stories I've seen is that there's always this caution about be careful not to to mess with um, the present because it will have repercussions into the future. Does your book have that kind of paranoia? And as you were writing the book, and because it's so close to your own story, did you imagine things that you might have wanted to change yourself that might have changed outcomes later? Um, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. So I, to answer the first part first, I did, um, that, that paranoia is, is present in the book in so much as, as, as I, as I think I said, Alice's father is a science fiction writer. And so he has, he has a, a lot of friends who are science fiction writers and, and there's a scene where Alice goes to them at a, at a, science fiction convention and it's like okay guys <laughs> tell
tell me, tell me how time travel works. And they, and they talk about things like that because that was, a, I mean, it's like referencing all the pop culture. Like I thought, like it's, I have to, I want to acknowledge all of the, all of the, the tropes and the, and the things that always come up in, in other science fiction. So I would say that my, my characters don't, aren't nervous for that. Um, but they do talk about it in the book. Um, sorry, in the second, the second part. You're on the right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, honestly, and this makes me sound sort of like a Pollyanna, maybe, but, but I feel, I feel pretty happy, you know, with, with like, with my life in general. And I also understand that like doing things badly sometimes is the, is the only way to learn. Um, and so I, I, I think if I were to, um, if I were to erase all of my own mistakes, I, I, I think I would be a, a, like a, a, less, a less evolved version of myself, you know? Like, I think it's, it's, it's better to keep the scars, you know what I mean? What about that other book that you had contracted to write? <laughs> Have you scrapped it? Or Are you from my publisher? No, no, I am not. I'm just curious, like, how far along were you on that? And is it worth going back to? Maybe, it, it, maybe. I mean, so I was, I was only about 50 or 60 pages in to writing the book. But as I said, I'm a planner. And so I, you know, I had already outlined and done, that book actually did require a, like some heft, not like super hefty research, but um, I, I had done a lot of work. I had done a lot of work on it. So I, I, I might, I mean, it, all I knew, all I knew was that it was not the time. You know, I, I think in the same way that, I mean, all of us here are readers, obviously, because otherwise, why would we be here? Um, and you know how some sometimes you pick up a book and you think, no, no, I can't, I, this is not for me right now. You know, and it doesn't mean that you might not read that book in, in a year or in 10 years and love it. But not every book is for every reader at every moment, um, and I think that's true for writing too. That it that it wasn't the time. It felt it felt too silly. It like it just didn't feel. Um, it didn't it didn't feel right. It didn't feel right. But that writing this book did. So so maybe maybe I I, mean, I, I probably owe my editor a phone call after after all this dies <laughs> down. <laughs> Any more questions? I like you. Um, you you just about how you outline your your characters and all of that. So I feel like I might be wrong, but I feel like of all the books you've written, you typically kind of go and you do different view, like different points of view from different characters. This is all Alice, right? Is there maybe your first book was although that was a little different. I mean, the, my first book was historical and like right. sweeping and covered like <laughs> lots and lots of decades. But yeah, but my my last few books have been like big ensemble family stories, and this one, um, this one I wanted, I really wanted to keep it much tighter um, and have it just be about Alice and Leonard and just from Alice's point of view. Um, and it was really, it was really fun. Like it was, it was a fun challenge for myself because I do I'm a curious person and I like to hop into other people's heads um but it was yeah I, I loved it I loved it and it was an, it, you know I think sometimes um and this book has a lot of this it, you know it, it's it's nice to remind yourself um to try new things absolutely well I can't recommend this book enough as well as her other books that she just mentioned just great books um, and you can buy her new book, uh, it's out this week, at the, um, I always forget, Nowhere Bookshop Tent. <laughs> um, she'll be signing in 15 minutes. And I want to thank all of you for sitting up here in the heat. I think a cold front's coming in tomorrow, like 80s or something. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, and I just, I just want to say also, this is, I think this is like the, the, 
best book festival I've been to. Like, I just, like my friend Mary Laura Philpott did a great event this morning. Um, Natalie, I don't know how many of you were sitting here with Natalie Diaz just one panel ago. Mind blowing poems. Um, Matt Barnett and Sean Harris doing their their thing. It's just every every single thing I've I've attended. Oh, and Kali Fajardo Einstein this morning. Every single event I've attended has been just like A plus plus plus. So thank you for having me. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby.